Okay, so everyone must be exhausted now, so uh, please feel free to sleep, but at least don't snore. <laughs> um, if you're here, that means you have a pretty good understanding of what dec decentralization is already, so I don't really want to go into the details. I'll just refresh your memory. On the... well, I'm trying to refresh your memory. But... Okay. is about transferring or distributing authority, control and responsibility, and financial resources from a central authority to um, other local autonomous groups or locations. And in our space, we talk about peers who are given this ability to take local decisions that are autonomous. On the blockchain, what we call... I hate this. On the blockchain, decentralization can mean several things, and um, the two major aspects of it are the architectural decentralization. What it means is, at inception, Bitcoin was launched by one person or group of persons, but anyone could go and install the client software that was in the mailing list of Satoshi. And that meant that anyone could go and freely mine um, in competition with other peers the reward that the, the death work was providing. And that means, legally, absence of monopoly over the allocation of resources. The second feature is the functional decentralization. Bitcoin is open source and is free participation in the protocol. That means that anyone, even if Satoshi dies, even if the group of core people that are working on Bitcoin today die, people can continue to work on the protocol updates and the network will continue to work. That means that it gets its, it limits highly the ability of anyone to um, take political control over the course of events. But this part is the technical side of this. It goes beyond regulation. When we want to discuss about the legal challenges of decentralization, what matters are the participants on this network that will need to face some of the challenges. And because we have only 20 minutes, I took the three major ones, mainly service providers, regulators, and customers. And for each of them, there's a keyword, so that if you want to sleep, you can just remember one thing. Uh, the question of liability for service providers, the question of reach for regulators, and the question of protection for customers. So let's start with, I'm, I'm really bad at this, I'm not a tech person. Um, Service providers. The, the challenge for certain uh, for service providers are the uncertain boundaries of their liability. So what it means is tokens are, as a matter of fact, digital assets that can be freely transferred worldwide. And by this very uh, inherent feature, that means that their use, so either because you're listing them or because you're dealing in that asset or because you are issuing them, you will face legal issues that are cross borders. Um, and this means that the scope of your territorial liability is theoretically um, worldwide. And then the second aspect of it is tokens by design are multifunctional. So even if they're not designed as means of payment, because they incorporate most of the time a utility, they will uh, trigger sets of laws that are Again, very various. So that could be money laundering, anti-money laundering laws, uh, tax laws, uh, litigations, um, customer protection laws, etc. So you you don't have a limit to the scope of your substantial liability either. So the very first assignment when you are working in the space as a service provider is to limit the scope of your territorial liability. So you can think that it's easy because most of you what they do what you do is to limit the access to your DAP or to your uh, a token or ICO and, and by uh, limiting the, the, the jurisdiction that can access to it and use the blockchain. But because you're a business and you're likely to be registered somewhere, because you're likely to operate somewhere or have personal staff somewhere, um, these laws are likely to be applicable. So what you want to do um, is what is called forum shopping. You want to pick jurisdictions where the laws that will be applicable to you are not over-regulated. And what it means is that I often get the question, well, wh where is the best place to, get, uh, to be registered, for example? And there is no such best place. It depends on the activity that you are conducting. 
if your activity is over-regulated somewhere, that's probably not somewhere when you want to have your staff or register. So that's uh, also very difficult to do in practice because there are laws that are mandatory, so it's not that easy. You're not free to choose just anything you want. But there are ways, technically, um, to go beyond regulation because it will be completely outside the scope of the regulation. And we've discussed this extensively today, so I'm just going to go very quickly over it. I took the example of a decentralized exchange. So imagine that you, as a business, you offer this smart contract. And um, you can allow peers to trade and to have more liquidity. There are various ways of um, designing DEXs, but I took this one because you know, it's a bit relevant here. Um, you can connect to a centralized exchange basically to increase your liquidity, but the only transaction that will really be seen on chain is the, the final transaction. So the peer can sign a smart check um, and, and benefit from the liquidity, but if you think about it legally, who is the counterparty in this transaction? From the, from the exchange point of view, is this the counterparty, uh, the peer, or is it the smart contract? And in the smart contract, is this the exchange or the customer on the exchange? So when you're working about any model laundering regulations or economic sanctions, if you're transferring, if you're facilitating transfer of value, because all tokens have a market value, so that's a transfer of value, what exactly is regulated and what is the scope of your liability? So you could say that, well, you know, it's a smart contract, so nobody can shut down the business, and if it's open source, anyone can use it, so in the end of the day, you know, even if the business dies or shuts down, it's going to continue to work. So it's not the business who is running the smart contract and thus the business. That would be very bold to consider that this is completely true in all jurisdictions. Um, the reason is, it's highly likely that the smart contract is designed in a way that um, some people will receive the fees or some people will have control over it. Uh, we've seen today with some of the um, projects that uh, the, the community could vote to uh, choose which tokens should be listed, uh, which uh, tokens should be integrated as part of the smart contract, what should be the updates, or if there is a bug, who can update the smart contract. And the very reason that these people have control over that smart contract and have control over that business makes them liable or likely to be liable under certain laws of certain jurisdictions. The question is just to what extent and which ones. Now the second aspect is to limit the scope of your substantial liability. Again, there are means that are very well known by lawyers to limit the scope of your substantial liability because, for example, you would subcontract part of your activity or you would use some clauses that are called uh, arbitration clauses or mediation clauses to exclude certain proceedings. You could resort to auditors um, that will limit the scope of your liability on certain parts of the, for example, uh, drafting smart contracts, etc. But again, it's quite difficult to completely exclude your liability. Um, as, of course, there will be mandatory rules and you will have a certain control over the business. The only mistake that you should not make, but no one in this room will make it because uh, you're probably the most informed uh, within the community, is to believe that code is law. Yes, code is law in terms of the technical meaning of it, as we saw. Um, the smart contract, let's say, uh, code underlying the, the, that um, will uh, determine the li life of the asset this is true, it will determine the life of the asset, but the people who will be using that token, issuing that token, um, facilitating its transfer, they will be subject to the existing laws. And the simple example would be all the backward-looking uh, guidances of the SEC, or just the fact that when you have a contract, you can interpret beyond its words. Uh, you can easily construe it using um, mechanisms of inter interpretation. So there is really no reason why a smart contract could be interpreted, interpreted uh, beyond its lines of code. Uh, so really the, the validity and the contract formation rules would substantially remain the same. Uh, the problem is that when you build this kind of uh, products that are innovative, then that creates a challenge for regulators, both uh, on the subject matter point of view and territorial jurisdiction point of view. The first thing when you have an innovative product is that to have a reach over that situation, you need your a legal qualification that could trigger a regime. So the regulator first needs to want to ask themselves, uh, is this truly innovative to the extent that I need new rules 
uh, because the, the rules that I have do not encompass the situation? Or is the, the thing that I'm dealing with is actually a new means of practicing something that already exists? It's just a new means of practicing an existing activity. In which case, they need to wonder, okay, which rules are triggered? And um, the, the, I took the example of token because it really shows that it's, there's not, no one-size-fits-all answer to this. Uh, when the tokens were issued, the SEC, for example, considered that it would trigger the laws of securities laws and commodity laws, while the European Union could not consider that they are financial assets. So uh, when the ECC considered that it's not truly innovative, it fits into existing uh, regulations, the European Union was trying to find new legal qualifications to classify the assets. The problem with them is they are so diversified, there are more than thousands of them, how can you fit these tokens into the regulations? So the question is, what do I want to do? What is the purpose of the regulation? What am I trying to protect? And then the second question for regulators is the territorial reach. Uh, because the laws are so diversified and everyone has uh, are sovereign, they have uh, laws that sometimes enter into conflict. And in this case, the most common or most famous one at this time is GDPR <coughs> and blocking statutes. So this actually is really interesting uh, legally wise because for the first time in history, this regulation basically limits uh, from the European perspective, the ability of other regulators to come and ask for information uh, for businesses which are either incorporated in Europe or have European customers or have other links um, with Europe. And what it does is, in countries like in Switzerland, you have no right to compel a business established in Switzerland to share information with third parties, <coughs> even regulators. So what they need to do is to come, if you would be kind enough, to share any information on a voluntary basis. And what it does is that it really empowers private parties to set the rules of this and the standards of how information will be shared around the world. So here we can see that regulators are not against us. We need to act with regulators to empower private parties and make decentralization happen. We sometimes have same uh, interests, and people who say that GDPR is poorly written, uh, it's not a good regulation, actually what they didn't understand is that it highly protects European interests and it's a very wise move from the European Union. The risk, however, is if you empower private parties to set the standards uh, for these kind of activities, you can easily foresee that there could be risk for the market integrity and fairness uh, because they could easily collude and, uh, for example, uh, create monopolies or unjustified barriers at entry. So what you need to do is, have, is to have uh, antitrust laws that are strong enough to protect customers at a macro level. And here, it's just a, an idea that I wanted to suggest, but there may be other means uh, to achieve that, that same idea, is to create some sort of logical centralization. So just as Bitcoin functions as a single computer, but relies on decentralized peers to make it work, we could think uh, on a regulatory um, aspect to do exactly the same thing. You could have centralization of common rules to what people could um, submit themselves, just like soft law, for example, on a voluntary basis, but the peers who are the customers will be the auditors and verify that these actors actually submit themselves to the rules they adhere to. And how do they do this? By not buying the product by actually looking and saying, we want this actor to get out because it doesn't submit himself to the rules that's... And, and the idea with logical centralization is that it would be compatible with all the local regulations. So you could have, just like when you fork, it's compatible uh, with backward-looking systems and models, but people could actually work on it and build on it. However, this is today a bit idealistic because it requires customers and regulators to work hand in hand and understand the technology and its vulnerabilities. And during this uh, summit, we saw that there are still a lot of vulnerabilities that are not necessarily well known. And to be completely agnostic, we can uh, mention uh, the, the vulnerabilities of all of them. So proof of work would be a too much centralized the hashing power on a proof of stake that would be uh, a too strong community spirit that would influence the course of event uh, on a delegated proof of stake that would be uh, maybe nodes that are corrupted. Uh, so we really need to understand all this and not just the tech people 
the, the people who are there to actually buy the product and regulate it. And the problem that leads to uh, more customer awareness is we understand that to reach this, uh, reach to decentralization, we need local, a, a higher degree of local participation. And what it really means is if people today do not read terms and conditions, how are they going to criticize, discuss, bring opinion about uh, tomorrow's protocols updates? Um, it, it, to bring sustainable decentralization, we need decentralization not to come too fast, otherwise people won't be able to keep up the pace of the new uh, system, and what all that will do is to shift the power to the hands of tech people who are the only one who understand really what is going on. And th that is reflected already today uh, by the fact that 50% of Bitcoin are held by the like, most 100 biggest wallets. Uh, it's even worse in Ethereum and maybe 70% on, on Ripple. Um, so we already have the idea that the people who uh, will not give up the pace will be left behind and will fail to reap the benefits of decentralization. Um, but to reach customer awareness, we need more metrics, uh, both on the primary and secondary market. And that's just an example, but also to understand better how utility tokens work. And this is where uh, I, I put this, why I put this little photo. And don't get me wrong, the last part could be a Picasso, so it's highly valuable. All it means is that at the moment that white paper is drafted, um, the end product might store it like completely a different, a completely different end product. So the customer has no tangible metric on which they can rely to assess what the end product will be. And uh, on the secondary market, the market cap is not necessarily always relevant because who today is able to say what is undervalued and what is overvalued? Uh, so a lack of metric. It is one of the, the barrier uh, that will not help, the, that will not enable the market, the, the market to scale up and let customers enter with the level of confidence that they need to uh, to come in a, in a massive way. And uh, that goes with the, the next one, which is the lack of legal framework. We need more activities like insurances and banks to come into the market to enable that uh, sustainable decentralization to happen. And the final point is about uh, litigations. Litigations are already very long, very uh, exhausting, very complex. If we have more problems with reach of regulators on a-national businesses, if we have anonymous, uh, the problem of anonymity on blockchain, etc., it will get even more complicated. So thankfully, we have a project like Claros and another project who work to find solutions on this, but we definitely need more maturity uh, on this. Um, so we are not at a dead end. There are people who already have um, suggested metrics, both at the macro and micro level. So um, you could look at market cap and volumes. That wouldn't be enough because you know you could have only one person who actually uh, to constitute the whole volume. So you need to also look at the traction metrics to see it, has it actually been adopted by the market. And what it means is look at the number of users that actually use the DAP or have downloaded the app. Uh, what, are, what is the number of the API calls, uh, the number of clients, how is it actually implemented in the market. And uh, finally, I wanted to uh, show some other ideas about how we can, what thing we can audit and what things we can look at before adopting uh, some of the tokens. Um, smart contracts, um, very uh, stupid idea. Uh, why don't we have lawyers who work in connection with developers and Everyone keeps saying that everything that you put on the blockchain is inalterable, so why don't we have terms and conditions written in a human-readable way that is in incorporated in, in the smart contract, in like the IPFS or like a as a hash or whatever, so that when there is a dispute, we know exactly what are the terms and conditions that were effective at the date the smart contract was entered into. Um, and just uh, because people do not know how to interpret the lines of codes. So let's take the very basic one, because um, you know I'm not a tech person, so I took like a very basic example, which is analog time. How do you know that it means that the contract is valid today, but will be executed tomorrow? Or that means that until that date arrives, one of the party can withdraw consent, that it's a promise or an option, or it just means that the parties have time to think about it and withdraw their consent before it happens. So when you have this analog time, you would have a lawyer that drafts the clause that, uh, that 
is uh, an explanation of what it is. Then just because we don't have much time, I won't go into the details, just like look at the, uh, the other ideas, looking at the token economic model, we need to audit this and understand what it means, so that it's not only benefiting to one group of people, uh, etc. Uh, I'm not sure if we have a question, time for questions, so if not, we do? Okay. of small customers uh, who are less informed or when there is an asymmetry of information. Uh, and the question is, so that's maybe, uh, that's your question uh, regarding whether we need to set more regulations at the customer point of view. Uh, but otherwise, for existing regulations and that a trigger jurisdiction of, of other countries, the question is, do we need more regulation? The question is, how will the regulation apply? Because this is not your decision to know whether a country will apply their laws or not. If you're conducting a business and you're triggering the jurisdiction of, let's say, the U.S., you can think that we don't need those regulations. The U.S. actually doesn't really care about what you think. It's just going to be triggered. So you can't, you can't just like conduct a business thinking, well, it's decentralized and no laws will apply. So that's for the like mandatory regulation. And then for soft law, that what you're saying it's true. If people didn't want that law, this is why soft law is not mandatory. They could opt in or not. And if they see that customers continue to use their product without them entering into the system, fine, their product will work. But maybe customers will say, oh, there is actually less uh, manipulation on this product, or this product works, works better because it fits the standard that everyone agreed on. So actually, I want to use that. So yeah. it doesn't harm anyone to. to Created soft law where people can just vote whether they agree or not. Absolutely true, and I think uh, there's also, also the other side is that if companies don't like certain regulations, they can opt out. This is law jobs. shopping and forum shopping. This is exactly. And they can take their business elsewhere, which harms those economies, and yeah. maybe they will not reap the benefits of innovation. Exactly, businesses create employment. They create uh, revenues uh, because they're taxed where they're based. It creates um, like a, a hub. Because when, look at Switzerland, because you had a few businesses coming, then it attracts other businesses as well. So it's not that easy, like, it's a competition between private and, and public, and also among public and private. Okay, so, with Bitfinex, when people used to say to me, as a US citizen, I'd like to trade with Bitfinex, I used to say, if only there was a way you could trade with not as an individual perhaps. And it was now that didn't want to be closed. So the new one was, if only there was a trustless method. <laughs> but now, of course, I'm thinking, how long do you think we have until the regulators decide that as an originator of a smart contract, you're going to need to KYC, AML anyone, that interacts with your smart contract? Because that's probably the next thing we should have coming, isn't it? So uh, you can open a customer support ticket on 
<laughs> yeah, so obviously uh, it will depend on the jurisdiction you're talking about. The regulators don't act at the same pace. Uh, we can see that U.S. regulators are obviously um, ahead of all those questions. Yeah, that's, we have to go as we have to walk as slow as our slowest story. And I think the U.S. is very much the worst case scenario. Yeah. And if the U.S. going to catch up, we've got to stay ahead of you. Exactly. So um, this is actually one of the things that I learned from our CEO that. Innovation is always ahead of regulation. Yes. So they can try to regulate, but at the time that they are regulating the smart contract, we're already with another product. Um, okay, so we need to on the next one. <laughs> so, are you saying that Americans can trade on trustless dot No, we're not. No, we're not. Don't write that down. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for a great.